Hi guys, the topic for today is tracheostomy. So let's start with the anatomy of trachea. The anatomy of the trachea, trachea, so what is trachea basically? Is that it is a fibromuscular tube supported by 20 haline cartilages which are open posteriorly. The soft tissue posterior wall is in contact with the esophagus. So there are three layers of the tissue that clothe the cartilage. A, fibro, uh, a fibrous elastic outer layer, a middle layer of the cartilage and the bands of the smooth muscles that wind around the trachea. There is some tissue containing blood vessels and lymph vessels and the autonomic nerves. Well, the inner lining consists of delicate ciliated columnar epithelium containing the mucus uh, secreting goblet cells. So here you can see this is the larynx, this is the trachea. In between you can see these are the cartilages. These are the further dividing into right and left principal bronchus, then bronchii. So let us talk about the blood supply. The blood supply is primarily supported by the brachiocephalic artery and through the inferior thyroid and the bronchial arteries. The nerve supply is by the parasympathetic and the sympathetic fibers. As we know that sympathetic uh, system acts in the flight and fright response. So with a flight and fight response stimulated by the adrenaline. So what its uh, effect on the trachea is uh, that it causes it relaxes the bronchi. It relaxes the bronchi and the muscles of the gut wall where it causes the increase in the heart rate where in the parasympathetic it's sub, uh, supplied by uh, supplying the trachea is by the recurrent laryngeal nerve a branch of the vagus nerve so it basically slows down the heart rate it increases the acidity to the stomach and constricts the bronchi so basically relaxation is by the sympathetic and constriction is by the parasympathetic now the trachea lies in the midline of the neck it extends from the cricoid cartilage to the sternal angle and really if you see if you draw this is trachea so from cricoid so from cricoid cartilage to sternal angle here and uh, posteriorly if you see from c6 from C6 to T4 so thoracic vertebra 4 inferiorly and cervical vertebra 6 superiorly so at the sternal angle it they uh, they strike a bifurcation we need to understand that then as it passes downward it follows the curvature of a spine and courses slightly backward so near the tracheal bifurcation, it deviates slightly to the right side. Now these are the relationships of the cervical trachea. So anteriorly we can see lies the skin, the, super, uh, the superior and the deep fascia, superficial and the deep fascia, the strap muscles, which include the sternothyroid, the sternohyoid and uh, So here lies the strap muscles, your omohyoid, your thyrohyoid, the sternohyoid, sternothyroid. Then the isthmus of the thyroid in the center, the inferior thyroid vein, the thyroid emma artery, which is seen in less than 10% of the patients, the pretracheal fascia and the plexus thyroidus impa. Well, if you see posteriorly of the trachea, we know there lies the esophagus, the reclinaryngeal nerve and the prevertebral fascia. When laterally lies the great vessels like the common carotid artery, the internal jugular vein and the nerve, vagus nerve. The muscle is the posterior belly, the omohyoid and the external jugular vein and the two lateral lobes of the thyroid. Well, coming to the uh, thoracic trachea. So anteriorly lies the thymus gland, the left brachiocephalic vein and the arch of aorta. Posteriorly, same as that of the cervical trachea, is the esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the prevertebral fascia. Well, going laterally, there lies that gate vest, uh, the uh, the vagus, the phrenic nerve, the superior vena cava, the anterior lateral on right side, 
the lung covered by the pleura, the left common carotid and the left subclavian arteries. Thoracic duct on the left side is agus vein on the right side. Now this is the diagram. You can see in the center there is trachea. These are the cartilages. This is in the center is the isthmus of the thyroid gland. These are the two lobes of the thyroid. Here you can see the common carotid artery. Further dividing into external and the internal carotid artery. This is the epiglottis. This is the hyoid bone. The thyroid cartilage. These are the membranes in the center. So superficially as we know there lies the skin and the superficial and a deep fascia. Uh, then uh, further going lies the strap muscles, uh, the sternothyroid, the sternohyoid, the thyrohyoid and the homohyoid. Second and the fourth ring are covered by the isthmus of the thyroid. We need to see there. That second and the fourth ring is covered by the isthmus. So what is uh, tracheotomy? So tracheotomy is a surgical opening into the trachea. Whereas the tracheostomy is a, as a permanent opening and exterizing the trachea to the cervical skin until the opening has become epithelialized. Well, we know that epithelialization after doing a tracheotomy it will take around three to seven days. So when there is the epithelialization, then it is called tracheostomy. And tracheotomy is just making an opening into the trachea. So we talk about the history that tracheostomy has been performed in the ancient Egypt at the one of the oldest surgical procedure. At the beginning of the 20th century, the principle of the operation were described by the Charlie Jackson and this remains the principles of operation to the present day. Well, if we talk about the indications of the tracheostomy may be necessary when the circumstances exist that compromise the adequate respiration. So whenever there is a compromise in adequate respiration, there are different options available uh, in which we can do a tracheostomy. So these are the upper way, uh, upper airway obstruction like inflammatory disease, benign laryngeal pathology, the malignant laryngeal tumors obstructing the airway, the benign and the malignant tracheal tumors, the laryngeal trauma, stenosis and the tracheal stenosis. Need for assistance to ventilation over a prolonged period of time, deficit of lower airway protection against the aspiration or oral or gastric uh, secretions and the clearance of the lower respiratory tract secretions. So these are the conditions in which we need to do. So tracheostomy indications to bypass the obstruction basically. So what are the causes which may lead to obstruction like congenital infectic malignancy, the trauma, the vocal cord palsy and the foreign body. These are all the reasons which may lead to the obstruction. So in congenital, there can be a subglottic or the upper tracheal stenosis. There can be a laryngeal web, there can be a laryngeal and the vellicular cyst, the tracheoesophageal abnormalities and the hemangioma of the larynx. In infective, there can be the acute epiglottitis, laryng uh, the laryngotracheobronchitis, the diphtheria or the Ludwig's angina, which may lead to the obstruction. When in malignancy, there are advanced tumors of the larynx, the tongue, the pharynx or the upper trachea presenting with strider. In trauma, there is a gunshot or the knife wound to the neck, inhalation of the steam or smoke, swallowing of the corrosive fluids. Vocal cord palsy, of course, the post of complication of the thyroidectomy, cardiac or the esophageal surgery, bulbal palsy. Well, the foreign body, yes, it obstructs the upper airway, swallowed and inhaled object lodges in the upper airway, causing the steroider. Strider. Now the tracheostomy indications prolonged intubation. So the need for the prolonged respiratory support such as in the bronchopulmonary dysplasia we need to do tracheostomy. To reduce the anatomic, uh, the anatomic dead space and increase the chances for the mechanical ventilation withdrawal. To improve the patient, see we can't uh, keep the patient uh, lifetime into the ICU so it also reduces the ICU time of the patient. To improve the patient quality of life, easier toilet ability to speak, eat and increase the mobility. Neuromuscular diseases uh, paralyze, paralyzing or weakening the chest muscles of the diaphragm. There is no fixed list of circumstances and morphological or pathological situations for the tracheostomy. However, there are a variety of alternatives to the tracheostomy. There is a non-invasive uh, positive uh, pressure ventilation with a face mask or a laryngeal mask, endotracheal intubation, endoscopic procedures to remove the uh, 
remove some foreign bodies. Now, tie over tracheostomy it can be open in which there is a high tracheostomy, mid tracheostomy, and low tracheostomy, where then comes a percutaneous also procedure also is there. So, talking about the conventional tracheostomy, so here you can see this diagram. This is the thyroid gland. This is the isthmus, the trachea, the neck. So, the patient is placed in the supine position with the head extended using a shoulder roll. A transverse incision is fashioned about 2 cm above the suprasternal notch. So imagine here is a suprasternal notch. So you have to give the transverse incision 2 cm above the cricoid, uh, 2 cm above the suprasternal notch and below the cricoid cartilage. So here is the cricoid cartilage. Here is your suprasternal notch in between above just 2 cm above the a uh, suprasternal notch, you have to give the transverse incision. The subcutaneous tissue and the platysma muscles are divided transversely. So, the subcutaneous tissue and the platysma muscles are divided transversely, entering the subplatysmal plane. The strap muscles are identified and then the dissection is changed to the vertical plane. So, before we gave the incision transversely. So, after opening uh, along the platysma and uh, subplatysmal plane then comes your strap muscles then we will open these vertically when then will we open it vertically so the strap muscles are separated in the midline here we can see how these are separated vertically the strap muscles are uh, separated in the midline with the retractor until the thyroid isthmus is encountered and the anterior wall of trachea is identified so this here we can see after retraction of the strap muscles which were in uh, which are separated vertically so now they are retracted laterally so we can see the thyroid isthmus and the anterior wall of the trachea so the thyroid isthmus is retracted cephalad above and the lateral uh, and the lateral traction sutures placed around the two second and the third tracheal ring the anterior wall of trachea is incised between the second and the third tracheal ring just behind the isthmus the cricoid should be palpated before the tracheal incision to determine the correct level at which the to enter the trachea. So, after retracting, see these are the two sutures placed around the second and third tracheal link and the isthmus is pulled up cephalad and uh, then the incision is given in the trachea after palpating the cricoid. Then the placement begins with the tracheostomy tube at the right angle. So first the tracheostomy tube is at right angles to the trachea. Then after that, then the tube is inserted, it is rotated. So it becomes parallel to the trachea. So be before uh, entering, while entering it is 90 degrees and after entering it takes, it becomes parallel to the trachea. The tracheostomy tube is sutured to the skin as an added precaution to prevent the accidental dislodgement of the tube. So then this tube, there are two holes with it is sutured uh, to the skin. To avoid the subcutaneous emphysema, pneumothorax and infection, a tracheostomy wound is never closely, uh, closely uh, closed tightly around the tube. Now here you can see the patient, the roller, uh, is placed just below the neck to give the extension. These are the trevis, these are the uh, trevis self-retaining forcep and the anesthetic catheter mount, the uh, cricoid hook and the tracheal dilators, the instruments used. So here you can see the position of the drapes. So this area in which you will give the incision of the uh, you will give the incision and infiltrate it's uh, cleaned with the beta ding and the drapes are placed in a square position one need to understand that the anesthesis always stand at the head end so had to have an easy uh, easy access to the endotracheal tube from above then what happens the transverse or the horizontal incision is given after the infiltration, we will give a horizontal skin incision or a transfer incision which is held by a self-retaining forcep. So, 
here the, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue is opened go, going up to the subtraticeful plane the strap muscles are clearly seen with the bloodless plane visible in the midline so first we give the transverse incision then we see the strap muscles now comes your vertical incision so with the strap muscles retracted after giving the vertical incision the horizontal is uh, the thyroid isthmus is clearly seen so here the thyroid isthmus is seen anteriorly then the thyroid isthmus is divided between the two hemostats the left side of the isthmus has been transfixed with the second hemostat still placed the tracheal rings are clearly seen and the cricoid cartilage superiorly so now we can see the trachea the cricoid cartilage the left side of the isthmus has been transfixed yeah now the tracheal dilator is used to open the trachea after incising vertically through the tracheal rings you can see this is the tracheal dilator which is being used so after giving an incision we will use the tracheal dilator then the loop of the tracheostomy uh, uh, after this the tracheostomy tube is taken which is first held uh, at the 90 degrees to the the hole created into the trachea then after insertion it lies parallel to the trachea so the loop of the tracheostomy tape is passed through the flanks here you can see and the silk suture holding tube is placed into the and here you can see the sutures are given to the skin so that uh, the tracheostomy tube lies in its place the end of the tracheostomy tape have been pulled through the loop and tied firmly around the neck of the patient you can see how it is tied firmly around the neck of the patient so finally the tracheostomy tube is correctly positioned so you can see the model how this tracheostomy tube should be positioned then what happens the cuff over inflation demonstrates so here is a cuff we will inflate the cuff around 7.5 ml of the air is pushed and this cuff is inflated we need to remember the there is a specific uh, amount of air that should be uh, pushed inside and the pressure should not exceed otherwise it will cause a vascular necrosis of the structures around the cuff so the what is percutaneous dilatation tracheostomy see it is a what are the benefits basically it includes the elimination of need of the operating room use or the anesthesia and significant reduction in the cost so it should be done in a carefully selected patients under the fiber optic control and to be ready to switch to open procedure if it doesn't succeeds so this is the percutaneous dilatation tracheostomy this is you can see the guide wire introduction with the removal of the sheath I have already made the video of the percutaneous tracheostomy, dilatation tracheostomy in the my previous, in which I have demonstrated how to do the percutaneous dilatation tracheostomy. So guys, you can go there and see that. Here you can see how the guide wire introduction with the removal of the sheath. The guide wire and the catheter are advanced together into the trachea as far as skin positioning mark on the guide catheter to the skin. So up to the, this mark, it is guided inside. So the guide wire catheter, the guide catheter and the dilator unit, this is the dilator unit, are advanced together into the trachea, into the skin positioning mark. The tracheostomy tube is loaded onto the dilator and advanced into the trachea over the guide wire and catheter. The guide wire and the catheter are removed, leaving only the tracheostomy tube in the trachea. So this is, a, uh, is how the percutaneous tracheostomy is done. How see the guide wire is inserted, the tracheostomy tube is inserted. So what are the post-op management? 
we have to check the PCV, the pressure control ventilation, repeat X-ray, soft tissue neck, strong NLGC antibiotics, IV fluids uh, until able to toilet early. So, what are the risk, risk factors and the complications? Well, obviously, uh, in infants and adults over 70, 75, it's com the complication and risk factor. The complication increases. Obviously, the thick neck. There is difficulty in uh, doing a tracheostomy in obesity because of the thick neck. Smoking, poor nutrition, the immunity is uh, low, the recent illness is there, especially the upper respiratory infection, alcoholism, chronic illness and diabetes, the healing is poor. So the complications, those complications can be generally divided into the categories, the early and the late. So the early complications, those occurring intraoperatively and early in the post-operative period, these are basically hemorrhage, the tracheoesophageal perforation and the recurrent nerve injury. The cricoid cartilage injury, the tracheostomy tube obstruction, tube dislodgement, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous emphysema and the wound infection. Well, if you talk about the late complications, those occurring in the late post-operative period, these are the infections, hemorrhage, granuloma, aspiration, the laryngotracheal stenosis, the subglottic stenosis, tracheosophageal fistula and the tracheomalacia. Then the tracheostomy tube care. See, the tube has to be changed. The indication is the soil or the cuff fracture. Complication is insertion into the false passage, bleeding, and the patient's discomfort. So, make sure avoid within the first week. The tube change should be avoided in the first week, and the first tube change should be changed by the surgeon. Then you can explain the attendant. Difficult case and like obese, short or thick neck. Be prepared for the endotracheal intubation because it's not easy in obese patients. Tracheostomy tube care. Uh, this is very important point that tracheostomy uh, tube cuff pressure should be approximately between 20 to 25 millimeter of mercury. So what happens when the over low cuff pressure is there it, like less than 18 mm of uh, mercury. So this will the cuff develops longitudinal folds and pr promote micro aspirations of secretions collected above the cuff and increase the risk of a nosocomial pneumonia because the secretions will pool down into the trachea. Whereas the excessively high cuff pressure, more than 25 to 35 millimeter of mercury, it will basically exceed the capillary perfusion pressure and can result in the compression of the mucosal capillaries, which promote the mucosal ischemia and the tracheal stenosis. So the pressure should be approximately between 20 to 25 millimeter of mercury, not less than 18, not less than 20, not greater than 25. So here you can see how this is a normal anatomy. These are the microcirculation. So as we increase the pressure, here you can see what happens. Necrosis is taking place. And if there is a low uh, cuff pressure, longitudinal uh, longitudinal folds develop, and there can be micro aspiration and nosocomial infection taking place. So let us talk about tracheostomy tube care. The humidification of the inspired gas is a standard of care for the tracheostomized patients. So indications for suctioning, yes, the secretions in the trachea, suspected aspiration of the gastric or the upper airway secretions, increase in the peak airway pressure when on ventilator, increase in uh, respirations or sustained cuff or both, gradual or certain decrease in the ABG, arterial blood glass, certain onset of respiratory distress, when we airway patency is questioned. So these, these are uh, these are condition in, the, in which these are indications for suctioning. Now the, what is the uh, protocol for tube exchange? Well, after the track is formed, the epithelialization of the stroma is formed uh, four to five days after the operation, you can exchange the tube. The rate of exchange depends on the clinical situation of the specific patient, type of discharge, type of tube and the medical stature, uh, stature, status and age. This should be done by an experienced staff. Now, there are different types of tubes, the cuffed, uncuffed, the fenestrated, unfenestrated, the single or double lumen, the various diameters. So basically what happened, the cuff is basically to protect airway and allow ventilation. Here you can see this, this is a cuff, this is a double lumen. So this is a plain cuff tube with an inner tube. Normally we use the Portex 7.5 in adults. This is the Mure's, this one is the Mure's uncuffed tube. See, you can see there is no cuff. 
Now comes these are the fenestrations. You can see small small holes are there. So fenestrated allow the patient to ventilate past the tube via the upper airway. These allow the speech. A patient with a small trachea or a marginal uh, respiratory stresses may benefit from the fenestrated tube. The additional airflow through the fenestrations in the tube can increase the tolerance of the speaking valve and or occlusion cap thereby aiding weaning. So single or double lumen. Double lumen allow easy cleaning where the single lumen has a greater internal diameter. So other types of tube, here you can see this is the bivona foam cuff tracheostomy tube. And these are the basic various parts, the obturator, the connector, the foam cuff, the tube tires. And this is a single cannula, she is pediatric tracheostomy tube. Now the speech, this passive mirror speech wall, speaking wall. Normally speech is or what happens, normally speech is obtained by a steady stream of air that comes from the lungs and passes by the vocal cord as we exhale. This air is modified by the vocal cords which vibrate as the air passes through the produces a sound. The tracheostomy speaking wall is one way wall that allows the air in but not out. This force uh, forces air around the tracheostomy tube through the vocal cords and out the mouth upon expiration, uh, uh, enabling the patient to vocalize. So about a decannulation, the resolution of the pathology that necessitate the tracheostomy. So if the pathology is over, resolution, so you can decannulate. Normal protective laryngeal mechanism, no aspiration during the normal swallowing, good cuffing is there. No planned further interventions like radiotherapy, head and neck operation is there. We can decannulate and no, medic, uh, no mechanical ventilation is further required. So these are the condition, conditions in which we can decannulate. So what are the steps of decannulation? Change to fenestrated first. It is not like directly change the tube. First you go change to the fenestrated uncuffed tube. So the patient can tolerate the uncuffed tube. Then start capping off tracheostomy. When 24 hours of uninterrupted capping to normal uh, saturation, decannulation is possible. Now here you can see what are the complications that can occur while doing a tracheostomy. Well, there can be leak due to the deflation of the cuff. See the cuff is deflated and uh, there can be a leak of air and also there can be micro aspirations. Partial withdrawal is there. There can be compression or tube by the overinflated cuff there can be dilatation of trachea from the overinflation of cuff as i have told the pressure should not exceed 25 mm of mercury it's called avascular necrosis there can be ulceration into the esophagus here you can see the nasogastric tube is there and uh, there is a there is a mild misplacement of the tracheostomy tube and which further can lead to ulceration into the esophagus here is a leak due to the cuff deflation and subcutaneous emphysema. So there, there is a leak, micro aspiration, nodal deflation and it can further lead to subcutaneous emphysema. Then misplacement into the pretracheal tissue. You are not into the lumen of the trachea. You have placed a tube into the pretracheal tissue. Here you can see the misplacement into the one bronchus. There is a disconnection and you are thinking that you have done something wrong in, into the trachea but there is a disconnection here. There is a blockage. You have to clean, suction the trachea, tracheostomy tube every 2 to 3 hours or 4 hours. See, there is a blockage by the secretions. The obstruction due to the herniation of cuff or cuff over the end of tube. So, others is the obstruction due to the kinking. So this thing you need to remember while doing the tracheostomy. Thank you.